Director Emeritus of Psychological and Brain Sciences and Black American Studies. He serves as the Director of the Center for the Study of Diversity at the University of Delaware. Savannah Shepard is a student at Swarthmore College and a social justice activist. Uh, Savannah uh, founded the Delaware Social Justice Remembrance Coalition and uh, helped uh, promote uh, public awareness of the kinds of research that had been published in journals like the Delaware History Journal, but weren't widely known by the wider populace. And this kind of citizen historian is essential to bearing witness to important histories. Dr. Yahuru Williams is an education advocate and ad activist. He's a professor of history. He's the Dean at the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. He had formerly been a professor of history at Delaware State University. He is the author of an article on the lynching of O.B. Evans in 2014 in the Do Delaware uh, uh, History Journal. And he continues to research uh, the history of racial violence in Delaware and he'll tell you more about his findings today. And uh, lastly, I'd like to introduce Alana Berry, to whom I'll turn it over. She is the founder and chair of the Brian Allen Stevenson School of Excellence. She is responsible for leading Governor Carney's Executive Order 24 to make Delaware a trauma-informed state supported through the Family Services Cabinet Council. She's also a trustee of the Delaware Historical Society. So it's good to have her helping facilitate the questions and the dialogue that we'll be uh, um, stimulating here in part uh, so that we can begin to heal as a community informed by the events of the past. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Alana Berry. Thank you so much, David. Um, and I am really honored uh, to be here today um, and participate in this conversation. And when I was asked to, to really talk about um, kind of why Delaware, why now, and and why we need this kind of community healing and why we need to be open to these kinds of conversations in our community. Um, a quote by James Baldwin came to me um, where he says, people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. And that I think really sits with me because I don't think we can have a conversation about healing um, unless we first address what's happened historically and in the past. And I think that's why, you know, the Historical Society is positioned to help facilitate these kinds of conversations. But we first have to understand and examine our current state and understand that that current state has been influenced and shaped and created by our past state right? Communities are still living with the generational trauma and harms of their parents, of their parents' parents, right? Of their parents' parents' parents. Um, and we can't ignore that. We have to first come to terms with that, that I am who I am and where I am today because of the, because of the stories and the decisions and the history of all of those that have come before me, right? And that and that connection to past is true for all of us. And that connection to past is true for what shows up in our society today, what shows up in our laws, in our policies, um, in, our, in our schools, um, the types of exhibits and stories we choose to tell, right? Those are all representative of what's happened uh, previously. And for many, History is power, right? And I think that's really critical. Um, history is power and it has also been the tool systemically um, to keep power as well, dependent upon whose story you choose to tell. And so I think as we enter into this conversation today um, and as we listen to and hear from each of the panelists, uh, really begin to think about how does this, how and why does this matter now? And what does this mean for me in Delaware and my community? We can't come to healing unless we first think about that. Um, and I frequently say there will, there will likely be times and there should be times where you may feel 
uncomfortable in this conversation. And that's okay, right? Um, I, I tell people to lean into that, lean into that feeling of uncomfortable and, and examine what, what's there for you, what's making you feel um, uncomfortable in that situation. The whole focus of the kind of unequal justice project um, is, is an effort to get to equity and justice and healing for our community and for our society. Um, and so we have to think about what's happening now, right? Um, 2020 has been an interesting year, I think for all of us. Um, but there have been a lot of riots and, um, you know, social unrest. And again, one of the quotes that came to me is a quote from Martin Luther King, and he says, a riot is the language of the unheard. And so my question for us today is, are we listening? Um, and if we are listening, whom then are we listening to, right? And so as we're here in this space today, challenge yourself to think about what are you hearing? And what does that mean for you? Um, what does that mean for your community? What does that mean for the people around you? And what action can come from this, right? Where do we then go from here after you've heard that story um, in particular? And I, uh, as we transition here, and I'll pass it back over to Stephanie, um, I'll leave you with this last thought. And again, it's a quote from uh, James Baldwin that says, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. And so as we enter this conversation today, I hope that it, I hope that it serves a, a place in, in raising um, some consciousness around what's happening, but I also hope that it serves as a space for you to begin to examine um, the society in which that consciousness is being created. So thank you. And I will pass it back to you, Stephanie. Thank you, um, Alana and Dr. Young for your words. And I'm going to now pass it over to Uhuru Williams, Dr. Uhuru Williams, who will share with us some of his research centered around the significance of today's date and is actually one of three cases that will be the focus of this first phase of the project. Um, so Dr. Williams, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Stephanie, I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, what I'm gonna share today is from a, a forthcoming book in the shadow of the whipping post, Lynching, Capital Punishment and Jim Crow Justice in Delaware but it's also, as Stephanie mentioned, part of the work that's being done by this commission to look at racial injustice in Delaware uh, toward the end of what Alana shared earlier. So I wanna jump right into this uh, because I'd like to um, get as much of this down as possible that we can possibly talk about in Q&A. So we gather today to discuss a murder that took place 159 years ago. It was not simply forgotten, but I would argue purposefully erased from the historical record by individuals at the time. In recovering that history, I want to acknowledge the other two known lynchings that I've written about. The lynching of Civil War veteran William O.B. Evans near Lipsick in July of 1867, and the killing of George White in Wilmington in June of 1903. Political, societal, and technological changes make the Evans and White lynchings more knowable. The documentation of the Evans lynching by the Freedmen's Bureau, active in Delaware and Maryland at the time, provided an external record that facilitated my excavation of that case. The advent of the modern press ensured that no aspect of the white lynching went uncovered and indirectly is responsible for my discovery of the case of Jacob Hamilton, who was lynched by Smyrna residents on October 11th, 1861, in an orderly program that mocks their designation as a mob. When I first began my project in 1999, the prevailing narrative was that there had only been one lynching in Delaware history, the spectacle immolation or burning at the stake of George White in Wilmington in 1903. I found this assertion suspect for a number of reasons that we don't have time to discuss today, but I will mention one, an editorial that was published shortly after the death of black motorist Reginald Hanna in police custody on March 9th, 2001. 
Hannah died in the back of a police cruiser in the shadow of the state capitol, less than a mile from where I lived at the time. I was shocked a few days later when an editorial in the Delaware State News declared, without challenge, in America, quote, it should be like when I was, when I was a little girl. Kill them, take them out, hang them on trees or the whipping post. Why don't they still do that, end quote. But my suspicions regarding the lynching were confirmed while researching the white lynching when I came across several references to other alleged lynchings that had occurred in Delaware. The Hamilton lynching, which I will talk about today, is made all the more noteworthy by its ties to one of the state's most well-known historic landmarks, Belmont Hall, and the prominent family that occupied it. When Carolyn Speakman passed away in October of 1922, she was still widely regarded as one of Smyrna, Delaware's most respected citizens. A fixture in local cir social circles, she could trace her lineage all the way back to the American Revolution. At the time of her death, she still resided in the family's home, Belmont Hall, a local landmark near the town of Smyrna. Quote, perhaps no other building its size in the United States is more chock full of historic lore, legends, and antiques than Belmont Hall, observed journalist D. Herbert Seifried in 1955, adding that, quote, the estate has been the home of three prominent families, all related at different stages down through the years, Cook, Collins, and Cloak Speakman. The home was located on a tract of land originally granted to Henry Pierman by William Penn in 1860, 18, sorry, excuse me, 1684, shortly after the later acquired the three counties that became the state of Delaware. Built in 1773 by Thomas Collins, the sixth and last president to govern Delaware before the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, the 13-room, three-story structure was assembled with bricks imported from England, reportedly played a significant role during the American Revolution. On the sea eve of the Civil War, however, the home was occupied by Carolyn's father, one of the wealthiest and most respected citizens in the area, 71-year-old farmer and slaveholder John Cloak, his wife Laura and their daughters, Carolyn, then age 20, and her sister Emily, then age 18. Sometime after midnight on Friday, October 11th, 1861, the servants of the Cloaks were awakened by a ruckus coming from the second floor of the home. Before they could respond, a distinct cackle of gunfire cut through the din of a pounding rain. Earlier that day, Cloak and his family had been preparing for his 72nd birthday celebration. Servants coming to the aid of the family that morning, however, found the day's cloak women shuddering outside and the house in disarray. They soon discovered John Cloak in an upstairs bedroom, suffering from a gash to the head. As, the cloak, uh, as Cloak's wounds were dressed, his daughters related the details of the events that led to their injuries and the gunfire. They were asleep, they explained, when em Emily noticed the lamp she kept burning in their room had been extinguished. When she called out to her sister to relight it, a man hiding in the shadows suddenly attacked them. After striking Carolyn, the man began choking Emily. The screams, their screams brought their mother to the girl's room. The prowler also attacked her, hurling a washbowl at her head. The commotion finally roused John Cloak, who entered the bedroom and fired three shots at the intruder before being struck on the head by the man. While they tussled, his wife and daughters escaped through a window via a ladder placed by a black servant on the ground, uh, alerted by the commotion. A shaken Cloak acknowledged that the intruder had gotten the best of him during the struggle dislodging the pistol from his hand and pinning him to the bed. The man he claimed briefly, briefly searched for the weapon, but being unable to find it in the darkness, hastily descended the stairs and forcing open a back door, escaped into the night. Within short order, the family fixed the blame for the attack on a 26-year-old mulatto laborer named Jacob Hamilton, whom Emily claimed to have recognized in the flicker of the candlelight preceding the struggle. Their suspicions were allegedly confirmed when they found a trinket supposedly given to Hamilton by a child the day before, and the remnants of a pair of trousers torn and left behind by the intruder. Employed by a tenant of the Cloak family for nearly two years, Hamilton was familiar enough with the family and property. He had been engaged to assist in Cloak's party preparations the day before. After daybreak, Mr. Cloak directed one of his tenants to summon the authorities to arrest Hamilton. The tenant was surprised a short time later to find the suspected intruder arriving for work as usual. He promptly gave Hamilton a list of chores to complete and hurried off to find the police. They arrived shortly and took Hamilton into custody. Custody. This point I'd like to read from the forthcoming article in Delaware History that chronicles the lynching. By the time the arrest party arrived at the magistrate's office a short while later, a large crowd had already began milling outside. According to Smyrna Times editor, Robert Hoffecker, who witnessed the lynching and whose office was a short distance away, a panic was evidently seizing the place and hatred deepened as the trial progressed. At the close of the hearing, the crowd was ready for action. I want to stop there for just a second. Hoffecker calls it a, uh, a trial, 
It's actually a hearing. There was no trial yet. They're just hearing uh, the charges. As the constables exited the building on their way to deliver Hamilton to the Dover jail to await trial, the mob followed closely behind. When they were clear of the magistrate's office, Hoffecker reported the indignant, indignant crowd seized Hamilton. A large pack of men and boys in tow marched him over to Main Street. With no further intervention from legal authorities, the murderous procession stopped near a large beech tree, conveniently bowed over the Sharps Mill Pond. There they began making preparations for a makeshift execution. While members of the party busied themselves gathering the tools for their work, others demanded a confession. Hamilton nevertheless continued to profess his innocence, right up until the moment before his killers hoisted his body in the air via a noose attached to the limbs of the sturdy beach. Authorities allowed his corpse to hang until 3.30 that afternoon when it was finally cut down. Despite the large number of spectators, including women and children, who witnessed and or participated in the gruesome spectacle, a coroner's inquest quickly determined the cause of death as strangulation at the hands of persons unknown. His death, was, uh, even, his death record was even more circumspect, listing his cause of demise as, quote, hanged by the neck, end quote, the same designation used for legal executions. As in most cases of racial violence, time and place are critical to understanding the circumstances that led to the lynching of Jacob Hamilton. The onset of the Civil War increased animosity toward African Americans in Delaware, especially in areas where slavery was practiced, large numbers of free people of color lived, and the Democratic Party remained strong. These tended to be border towns of Kent County, including Dover, Lipsick, and Smyrna, all experienced episodes of racially motivated violence in this period. Two, Lipsick and Smyrna, had lynchings. Despite staying loyal to the Union, Delaware remained divided on the issue of slavery and secession on the eve of the Civil War, largely along geographic lines. Those tensions and divisions were also most acute internally within border communities. A June 19, 1861 article in the Delaware Journal and Statesman, for instance, located strong anti-Union sentiment in this region. Quote, we've conversed, the author observed, within the past few days with gentlemen from every county in the state, and particularly with those in Kent and part of Sussex, and they are unanimous in their opinion that the Union feeling predominates everywhere except in Smyrna and Dover. The author observed, in those towns, a few tumbling politicians in the shadow of the light of other days are rolling their secession balls. But as their accumulations are made up mostly of political filth and their movements like the aforementioned tumblebugs are altogether backwards, their efforts will not amount to much more than a final and everlasting burial of all their political hopes, ambitions, and aspirations." End quote. Despite this forecast, there was real fear on the part of this group of people who appeared willing to do whatever was necessary to maintain white supremacy, including in the case of Jacob Hamilton resorting to murder. I say this without sufficient time in this session to explore all the indications of such, but invite everyone to do so in the next issue of Delaware History. In my time remaining, I'd like to briefly talk about a battle in the press that emerged after the murder that seriously called into question both Hamilton's guilt and the mob's motives for his murder. While Smyrna Times editor Robert Hoffecker took a more apologist view of the violence, a battle between Caleb P. Johnson, owner and editor of the Delaware Gazette, alternatively known as the Democratic Bible, and regarded as the most influential Democratic newspaper in the state, with its publish, publishing offices doubling as the state's Democratic Party headquarters, went to war, in essence, over this with Delaware State Journal and Statesman owner and editor Henry Eckel, at that time a registered Republican. At least initially, Eckel's newspaper repented, reprinted the dominant account of the lynching, which suggested that Hamilton had entered the home of the cloak women to assault them. But after sending a correspondent to talk to residents of Smyrna on Friday, October 18th, 1861, the newspaper published a starkly different account, directly contradicting earlier accounts that seemed to suggest overwhelming local support for the mob action. The correspondent identified only as Kent indicated that the community was in fact divided over the murder based on the questionable evidence against Hamilton. Quote, while the better class of persons have little sympathy with the accused and much for the injured family and feel indignant at the illegal conduct of the Negro, can observe, it also has a right to be indignant at the illegal conduct of the mob because it cannot fail to see the cause of the Negro's execution was not so much the crime itself as the hatred of his persecutors toward the blacks. He continued, quote, it is said that prominent persons lent themselves to mob spirit, but that evidence tending to criminate the Negro is not as strong as that is first supposed. And now notwithstanding the known connection of certain persons with the execution, 
a coroner's jury determined that the Negro was hung by persons unknown, end quote. Having raised questions about the strength of the evidence against Hamilton, Kent turned his attention to those responsible for his killing and dangerous precedent established if they remained unpunished. This setting of defiance of the court and law ought to be stopped, Kent argued, and the attorney general owes it to the people to have this whole matter investigated and the guilty parties punished. Kent further lectured his readers, quote, it may not be a welcome fact, but it is true that those who in this case took the law into their own hands are guilty of murder, a higher crime in the eyes of the law than that of their victim, which was only to commit a crime. The people owe it to the dignity and supremacy of law to have the offenders punished. If they do not, the precedent for the exercise of mob law will be established." End quote. In making the case for the supremacy of law over the vengeful influence of the mob, of mob justice, Kent steered the conversation away from morality and squarely into the arena of law and order. And what should become of the same with the advent of mob rule? Mob rule. In calling for the legal persecution of those responsible for Hamilton's murder, decoupled from the crime for which he was accused, Kent deftly invited further scrutiny on the judicial process in Delaware that would expose a man to legal jeopardy without the very due process Hamilton had been denied. It was a nuanced but important argument that would also bolster the case against Hamilton's killers had they been arrested and tried, which they were not. After receiving a strong rebuke in the Delaware Gazette that painted him as, quote, tinctured with black republicanism, Kent fired back with a blistering critique of his own in, November, in the November 5th issue of the journal and Statesman. He reiterated his claim that anti-black sentiment was the driving force behind the mob's actions. Quote, it may be this, it may be that I am as opposed to lynching even Negroes, that I'm strongly tinctured with black republic, republicanism, but I can tell him that I'm tinctured with humanity, which is more than can be said of any man who approves, palliates, excuses, or apologizes for mob law, end quote. In his zeal to make a point about mob law, Kent also exposed other dangers associated with being black in Delaware in this period, uh, things that James Jones will expand on in his discussion with you. He illuminated the tenuous claim to liberty free people of color truly possessed. I'm gonna quote him here from his um, essay. The wholesale persecution of blacks in the state is disgusting and lamentable. It is inhuman and unlawful. In some towns, there's a curfew bell and no black must be upon the street for any purpose after it tolls on pain of imprisonment and 12 lashes. It is so at Dover and Milford and the local focos in other towns would not let such an excellent precedent go unfollowed. Does a Negro pass by a place where a political meeting is being held? Be his intent charitable or necessary for medicine or a physician? Does he possess a rusty gun barrel? Off he goes to prison, find $20 and imprisoned till paid. Does he worship his maker after a certain hour? Down upon him pounces the fee greedy officer. Does he come before a jury? Whatever be the evidence, there is no sympathy, no mercy, and no acquittal for him. Does a white man refuse to kick and cuff and beat a black or eat uh, inappropriate word for breakfast every day? He's an abolitionist. The tinctured with black republic republicanism. This may be citizen's law or Smyrna law, but it's neither human nor divine law, end quote. King concluded, if writing in favor of the mob law eases your conscience or excuses the acts of your friends, by all means continue to enlighten us upon the new code of ethics. But take care that you don't practice upon whites, that is of a general scale, what you preach against blacks, else other grand jury will not have it say that they don't know whom to indict. Um, I'm gonna end, I have about four minutes left by talking about the legacy of this lynching. When Smyrna celebrated its 250th anniversary in 2018, Belmont Hall was featured prominently in the coverage, including a demonstration by Civil War reenactors to simulate life in Delaware during the Civil War. And while the colonial history of the mansion, including its role in the American Revolution and the death of a lone sentry who was killed there during the Revolutionary War were well documented, uh, there was no mention of the brutal lynching that linked the mansion, the Cloak family, and the town to the full sweep of 19th century Delaware and American history. In his 1955 article on Belmont in the Morning News, David, David Seyfried shared the legend that even today when the wind takes a certain course around the eaves of Belmont Hall, a person can hear the woeful wailing of the wounded sentinel. Perhaps it was not the spirit of the sentinel, but other ghosts of Belmont's past that continue to haunt the structure forgotten in the long sweep of history. In a 1982 article discussing the pending sale of the home by the Speakman family, journalist Bill Frank recorded the observations of Marjorie Speakman, wife of Carol, Carolyn's son, Cummins Speakman. 
Beaumont Hall, she observed, is not a museum. It's a home in every sense of the word, home. But perhaps it should be a museum one day, and no doubt it will be that. If that day should ever come to pass, the history of the home must acknowledge more than the cosmetic changes made to the edifice during the Civil War and forthrightly address the fruits of the racial fu racially fueled violence that germinated from the events that transpired there in October of 1861. In so doing, it would, be help, it would help remember not only this dark chapter of the home's history, but of the history of the state and the nation itself as recognition of the country's long troubled history of racism, criminal justice, and extra legal violence. And I am going to stop on that note and hopefully we'll be able to pick up with uh, more in the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And um, I will repeat, if you do have a question for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we will now transition to um, Professor James Jones. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I want to um, begin by uh, uh, thanking uh, the provost at the University of Delaware, Robin Morgan, who uh, first uh, tasked me with advising her on how the university could be involved in what was perceived to be a very important project. Uh, and I, as David mentioned earlier, I met with I met with David and. Uh, Justice Strine and, and others uh, early on to start thinking of, for me to start thinking about how can we uh, engage the university community in this project and what how should the project evolve and unfold, given that it was very, very either broad or narrow, depending on your point of view. Uh, and we've had as we've had many very good uh, strategic discussions. Um, the the um, the initial idea was rooted in the idea of racial terror, uh, and the focus was on lynchings. But as we saw, as we have seen from Yuhuru, uh, there have been three lynchings. Uh, but there are other forms that brutalization takes. Uh, I want to focus on uh, an aspect of our definition of unequal justice, which is white supremacy. Uh, white supremacy, in my view, is the foundation of inequality and unequal justice. It is through white supremacy, and Ru mentioned this in, in his presentation, it is the root of all of the disparity, the inequality, the brutalization, the inhumanity, the legal and extra legal ways in which black people have been denied human rights, civil rights, every sort of rights. Um, I want to uh, call our attention to two things that really, for me, uh, capture uh, white supremacy first. Uh, we're all familiar with the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. It was enacted in 1865. The Emancipation Proclamation was given in 1863. And in 1865, when the 13th Amendment was out for ratification, Delaware General Assembly refused to ratify it. As a result, Slavery did not end in Delaware until the 13th Amendment was actually ratified and enacted. That is, for me, uh, a, a fundamental foundation to a white supremacy and gives us a, a foundation for understanding how deeply rooted white supremacy is in the processes of our, our, our state. Uh, a second aspect around this time was uh, an interesting idea that uh, Abraham Lincoln proposed as a way to cut it, to try to reduce uh, slavery in, in the states, offered to pay slave owners to uh, free their slaves. I don't know what the, what the going rate was, but what is interesting is that Delaware rejected that proposal 
with the reasoning that, quote, it is the first step to elevating the Negro to an equality with the white man, or rather to degrade the white man by obliterating the distinction between the races. That, that is pretty much a definition of white supremacy. And so that is the foundation upon which uh, we sort of begin this, this project. And it, it, it's um, bookended by the 1861 lynching that Drew has just de delineated and the 1867 lynching. So in this time when we're, they're lynching people, you can see the context in which white supremacy is driving decision-making policy uh, positions um, and social beliefs about black people in this state. Um, in my view of, of what, we're, what our uh, objective ultimately is, is that there are really two, two stories. The first uh, rooted in white supremacy as, as we've been talking about. Uh, and I, I think um, one of the things that's clear is that white supremacy is a complicated interstitial aspect of our society. And it's not simple to look at an example and, and think you've got it. It's infiltrated every aspect of our society. And so to extricate it, to understand it and extricate it is going to take some very careful and very thoughtful research. It's going to take testimony. It's going to take openness. It's going to take uh, a lot of uh, honesty. Uh, and it will be not a simple matter. But I think as, as Alana mentioned in the very beginning, what I'm trying to suggest is that this foundation is integrally and intimately connected to our present state. And the, the project, I hope, will make that connection in intimate ways that will give us a, a complete picture. The original, uh, I think, definition of the project was changing the narrative. And so what, what we're really talking about is in some sense changing the narrative, but also in some sense writing the narrative. We're writing a new narrative uh, and we're not trying to just edit the old narrative. We're writing a new narrative and it's a narrative based in honesty and integrity and reality and knowledge and feeling and emotion and values, all the things that are important to a civilized humane society. And that's, I think, what the end state of this is, uh, a humane and, and a civilized society for all the citizens of Delaware and indeed the world. Um, the second, so the first story is the white supremacy and all the obstacles it presented to black people. Uh, and uh, that is kind of the unequal justice part of it. The other story is the ways in which black people resisted, persisted, and contributed to their own well-being in the face of this white supremacy and in the face of the inequality that they were subjected to. That is a very important story. And I think the museum, the Mitchell Center, has really begun uh, to examine that and will continue to. We hope that the project will contribute to that examination and we will see, uh, I think, in the stories of ways in which Black people have contributed significantly to the, we the welfare of this state. Obviously, as slaves, uh, we've, and I live in Sussex County, uh, and Sussex County had about 75% of the slaves in the state. Um, so we know that that contribution to slavery. But it's also, interestingly, Delaware had per capita the largest population of free blacks, which is kind of interesting. And they were, as free blacks, hired out as, as laborers in, in building the economy of Delaware. I don't know how well that story is, has been told, or, and certainly we would certainly like to be able to help um, clarify that story. Uh, so, so it's important that we look not only at the brutalization that African Americans experienced, but their resilience in responding to that brutalization, responding to that inequality, 
and forging a way to build community, to build the strength of, of their mental and physical capacity. So that, that's an that's um, important part of uh, kind of the context in which I approach this, this project. Uh, next. Yeah, so uh, I'm a social psychologist. I'm not a historian. And uh, this is a, a model of um, taken from my book on, on prejudice and racism. I want to briefly, oh, <laughs> I set my clock and forgot to start it. Um, I want, uh, when I was first asked to write a book about the social psychology of racial prejudice in 1970, it was clear to me that prejudice was something that individuals were. And that was not going to get at the depth of the institutional and cultural practices that sustained racial inequality. So uh, I proposed to the uh, publishers that we change the title from prejudice to prejudice and racism. And this model is, is my view of how, how it works. And I, I think uh, culture is really the driving force in what we think, what we feel, what our traditions are, what our values are, what religion we practice, the worldview that we hold. And that culture then shapes what the meaning of race is, how we uh, utilize race, how we implicate race in our institutions. Our institutions then are further organized and structured and function around race under the aegis of the cultural values that we already have. So the media, justice, education, politics, economics, family, all that are institutional ways in which race is instantiated in our, in our society and ultimately in our consciousness. And it's in our consciousness as individuals that race becomes uh, intertwined with the things we believe, the things we value, the kind of people we are, and the kind of behavior we exhibit. And that behavior then becomes part of the function of institutions. So our leaders, shape the institutions by virtue of their own individual uh, racial uh, understandings and beliefs and values. And further, the institutions then, depending on how they practice, become uh, instrumental in what the culture uh, ultimately looks like. And, and the important point is that these dynamic processes uh, go on over time. And over time, they change and shift and shape shift and value shift, but but the elements are there and the elements repeat and recur as as we go through new iterations. So clearly, we are a different state in night in 2020 than we were in 1861. But the remnants and the elements of these uh, aspects of white supremacy are still with us not only in terms of what people believe, but just in how the institutions have been functioning for so many years. So it's important for us to be able to identify ways in which institutions perpetuate the, the fundamental notions of white supremacy, even if we don't articulate any kind of belief or value in white supremacy. That doesn't mean that we're not um, furthering elements of that particular uh, idea. Okay, next. This is, uh, so in, in social psychology, there's a, there's a branch of social psychology called cultural psychology. And the dictum of cultural psychology is culture and psyche make each other up. That you don't have culture without psyche, you don't have psyche without culture. And so that, that's, I think that's important because it means that how we shape our culture influences what we believe and what we think and how we how we view the world and i think that it's fair to say that in the last year our world is being challenged the world that we have 
looked at is being challenged more than it has been in a very long time. And we hope that the psyches that are responding to this change are also going to be in the position to change the culture. And I see this as kind of the big, the big value, the big goal of the Unequal Justice Project is really changing institutions, changing culture, changing psyches, and in the end, changing the way in which we understand who we are and what is uh, valuable for us to do. Um, <clears throat> next. So um, I tried to uh, kind of break down just a little bit um, the dimensions of unequal justice. Uh, and these vary from physical to psychological to resistance to contributions. Uh, and I'm, as I say, I'm not a historian and some of these things I've already mentioned, but uh, uh, slavery is obviously a, found, a fundamental and foundational principle for the experience of, of Black people in Delaware and the enactment of white supremacy. Uh, terror and brutalization is an instrument of white supremacy. It's not only to um, exact a, a kind of what you, they would call justice. It is, in fact, a way of maintaining racial supremacy. And that supremacy doesn't always have to be physical. Uh, the whipping, I just, it's interesting that the whipping post in Georgetown is, was it this, this summer came down and has gone into storage or somewhere out of sight. Uh, so that's night, that's 2020. I think Delaware was the last state to uh, eliminate whipping posts in, I don't know, was it 1952 or something like that? May have been more recently. So Delaware is not a trendsetter in, in white supremacy. They, they are in an anti-racist uh, activity. Uh, they do have certainly had a, a great number of anti-racists. There were a number of people who, who um, argued strongly, there's strong Quaker influence that, that, that uh, made uh, certain people in Delaware very much anti-slavery, uh, anti-lynching, anti-inequality. Uh, but they were also pragmatic, very much like Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and others. Uh, it, it comes at, uh, we are very happy to be supportive if it doesn't cost us too much. And I think that is one of the, the real sticking points that there's a limit to which people are willing to go to effect change. And I think the kind of change that is being called for now is gonna take more than just an, a, a convenient way to um, make progress. Uh, black activism and resistance, as I said, is very much a part of this. This is a very, uh, there's nice ex exhibitions in um, the Mitchell Center and the De 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 Delaware Historical Society of people who've been engaged in this. There's obviously the abolitionists, the Underground Railroad was central in Delaware. Um, community organizations and actions are are proliferating now and have always been a part of the Delaware Black community. Uh, protests have always been part of it. And these are uh, ways in which um, I think Black people have insisted on um, attaining the kind of civil and human rights that uh, they are entitled to. Uh, and in spite of the white supremacy and in spite of the obstacles, Black people have made significant progress. It's not, not where it needs to be, but we have made significant progress and we have made significant contributions to the welfare of the state. All these are areas in which research uh, can provide more particulars and, and more examples and particularly um, research that allows us to see ways in which previous generations have informed subsequent generations. And by incrementing across generations, we can get from 1861 to 2020. And we can look at the policies 
in the criminal justice system, the educational system. Our colleague Ted Davis has been writing a lot about educational inequality. That's a very important area. Um, and uh, the six degrees of segregation I mentioned earlier are, is a way in which Yuhuru has in, in his book on civil rights, uh, articulate the, the domains in which rights are sought and rights are denied. So housing, residential segregation, all these involve segregation in some form, housing, education, voting, Jim, Jim Crow justice. It's not exactly Jim Crow now, but it is the criminal justice system, which is a form. Uh, transportation, public accommodations, um, that may not be as big a deal now. And certainly labor practices, whether they're uh, real or imagined unions and uh, other entities uh, create opportunities or deny opportunities to people based on a variety of factors, including race. So these are areas that research can, can and should and needs to take place. And there are research areas for the Unequal Justice Project to, to close the loop and uh, complete the, the narrative. So uh, next, next slide, I think I'm about, about done. So given that uh, culture is historically rooted in white supremacy, the institutions have been structured and mandated to implement a white supremacy objective, whether they, certainly that was patently true in the past, it is subtly true now. Individuals have been socialized in and by this white supremacy culture, whites to maintain it and blacks to disrupt it and to protect themselves from it. So I, th I think we have, when we understand white response and black response, we understand that they come from a different context and a different consequence. And it's important for us to see how that context and consequence shapes their relationship to these dynamics. Uh, the processes followed a dynamic evolution over time, thus our time, and this is a point Alana made very clearly, our time is a product of past times. And I think that that's what gives vibrancy and currency to this project. Um, so finally, we, we seek to capture the narrative in knowledge, actions, voices, memories, and awareness uh, to affect positive change in understanding policies, practices, and actions to better represent the opportunities, human rights, and spirit of all citizens of the state of Delaware and beyond. I think it's important that we recognize this is not something for Black people alone. This is for humanity. This is a way to understand how have we as a, as a people created uh, institutions that deny some of us the, the, the rights of citizenship, the rights of being human. And how do we change it so that all of us can be part of this uh, very amazing experience of being a human being on the planet? Uh, and I think uh, that's a big picture of you, but I think it's something that um, we aspire to in the project. And we hope that it will um, be something that everyone can be can participate in. I think that's that's because I know Stephanie has very much tried to bring people in uh, to the project, and I think we want it to be one that's live uh, and uh, interactive. And it's not just we're going to do a thing and give you our report. It's that we're all going to produce something that's going to be valuable and useful to all of us. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor James Jones. Excellent. Um, and again, I want to remind um, those who are attending that you can put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will have time at the end um, to address your questions for any of the panelists. And James has left us off on an excellent segue uh, to Savannah Shepard's work in how we can take this history and affect positive change in our communities through the work that she has done around the history of George White. Um, so I will turn it to Savannah. Thank you so much. I first want to say how excited I am to be a part of this project. Um, and thank you to everyone for listening to us. And I know that we have big hopes for this project and hope it can you know, really give people hope um, in the future of Delaware. Um, but I want to start by looking back into how I got into this work. Um, definitely was not the trajectory my life was on. Um, when I, I grew up in predominantly white schools, I had no interest in, in fighting for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I wanted to fit in with all of my white peers. 
Um, if I could be white, I would have done everything I could to be white. Um, but as I got older, I started to come into understanding my roots and my past. Um, that really happened for me um, when I was 15 years old and I had the amazing opportunity to go to the Legacy Museum, the opening of the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, opened by the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, I went on this trip with my family, um, but I you know, decided I wanted to go just so you know, I could get a few days off of school. Um, it wasn't to like learn all this history. I wasn't expecting it to impact me in any kind of way, um, but I was very, very wrong. During the trip, I was able to hear so many stories um, of people who have been doing the work of social justice and racial justice and hearing the real life accounts of the things that they have come into um, and just all the injustice in the world. And I was very shocked to hear all the things that I didn't know. You know, as a black person, you think you know and understand so much history about the country that you live in or the state that you live in. Um, but I knew almost nothing that people were talking about. Um, this really struck me. I was really, you know, I was, you know, been in AP US history. I thought I knew all, you know, everything I could about US history, but so much had been left out. Um, and I knew that this just didn't seem right to me. And so a project like this is so important because I feel like this history, this knowledge needs to be more widespread. Um, and this project would do an amazing job at that. Um, but while I was there, I was able to meet incredibly influential people like Claudette Colvin um, and Bernice King. Uh, Claudette Colvin refused to give her seat up on the bus before um, Rosa Parks did. She was you know, just a huge monumental person um, and just meeting people like them who have been these huge change makers and who were fearless in this effort really inspired me. Um, and I am so grateful for this opportunity because it lit a fire in me. I was able to be like, wow, these people are doing this work. They look like me, they have stories like me. And yes, like I am, you know, a lot younger than they are now, but the work is still, it still needs to be done. Um, and I really felt like I had a position that I could, could do this. But I wasn't really sure how, but as I was in the Legacy Museum, they have this discovery board. Um, and on it, you can click and like on your state and see how many lynchings there were. Um, so I went up to this board and I was not expecting to see anything for Delaware because I had never heard of a lynching in Delaware. Um, but I did, I saw one. And I clicked on it and it was in Newcastle County, which is a castle, the county that I live in. And it said George White. Uh, I was very surprised and his name just stuck with me. I didn't really know much about his story or anything like that, but I knew that like, the, I was very shocked. So George White, you know, stayed with me until I got home and I did some more research. And for those who don't know the story of, of George White, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, so on June 23rd, uh, 1903, um, George White was accused of um, attacking and killing a white woman named Helen Bishop. And Miss Bishop was a daughter of the head of the Ferris School in Wilmington. Um, George White proclaimed his innocence, um, but while he was being held in, New in a Newcastle County workhouse, a local minister spoke to a crowd of 3,000 calling for swift justice. Mr. White was not tried in a court of law, but dragged by a mob from the workhouse where he was being held while awaiting trial. Before a crowd of thousands, he was burned alive. Spectators collected his bones as souvenirs, um, and the news of the story is very widespread. So I was, I was learning, I was doing a lot of risk research on this and, and I was talking to my mom and I was like, is there anything in place to remember him? You know, how come I have never learned his name and why isn't this something that we learn in, at least in Delaware schools, if not across the country, we should be, you know, learning about, you know, everyone who's lynched. But um, so I started the process of kind of figuring out what I could do. So I reached out to the Delaware Department of Public Archives and just to see if there was something to memorialize him, um, they had said no. And, you know, this really struck me. And I, as my mom and I were talking, we, you know, decided that I think the best thing that I could do was go through the Equal Justice Initiative and do their community remembrance project. Um, and this is where you engage with the community, you gain a lot of knowledge, and then you do what you can you to erect a historical marker and do a solar collection like the picture on the screen um, in the place where the lynching occurred to memorialize the victim. So there's a lot that went into it. We had to, I had to go around and speak to different schools and conferences and, you know, go speak at the libraries and, and try and gather a lot of support. Um, I was very lucky to have the support of Senator Brown, um, who also funded the marker. Um, but we worked hard to find a location to erect the historical marker as well. And we decided on doing it at Workhouse. 
um, there is still like a post that's still there. So it's in Green Bank Park. Um, and so the picture on the screen, that's soil. The soil is collected there um, and the marker is currently there as well. Um, but, you know, we wanted to make the ceremony as impactful as possible. So we had a ceremony on June 23rd um, and it was very beautiful. There was, you, you were able to see the community come together um, and it was, it was good to see something that I could do um, as a young person. I was, I think, 16 or yeah, 16 at the first ceremony. Um, and I was very happy to be able to see that like a young person can make change, can bring people together, can help people understand a part of their history that they didn't previously know. Um, and it was just beautiful. And then unfortunately, six weeks later, I received a call from Congresswoman Lisa Mont Rochester that the marker had been stolen. Um, and I was very shocked. I, you know, you can expect there to be some pushback against something talking about racial injustice, but, you know, six weeks had passed. I didn't think that anything would happen at this point. Um, but it was stolen, but it didn't, it didn't deter me. It didn't stop me. I knew that this was needed. Um, so I worked to have another marker put in place, but I knew that since this was stolen, I knew that there was still a lot of like education and, and knowledge that needed to be spread. So I continued to go around and speak to different schools. I tried to gain um, support from younger people, people my age. And then we were able to have a second ceremony on October 20th of last year. Um, and it was just, it was even better than I could have expected. Um, it was nice to see people come together again and to realize and be able to see like this tension, this racial injustice is still very much here. It's not something of the past. It's very much current. Um, and we can see in a form of hate crimes um, or police brutality. And it was, I think, really important for people to be able to see that and acknowledge that uh, once and for all. Um, the coalition also held a prayer service um, this summer um, to memorialize and recognize all of the black lives that have been taken from us because of racial injustice, because of police brutality um, and just the hate in this country. And we were able to memorialize people like Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and the thousands of others who have been taken from us that we may not know by name. Um, and it was really important for me to do that because I think that we need to bring this history to the present because it's not something that we can just forget about or brush under the rug. It's something that is very current and important for us all to talk about and know and acknowledge. Um, so while doing this work, I've had a very positive uh, reaction from, from most people. A lot of people want to get involved or learn more and that's you know huge for me. It's so exciting, and I think my my biggest goal is to get a lot of people who are my age or younger to get involved because I think we have such a strong position and we have a lot of power that we don't always know we have uh, um, to you know fight for change. Uh, there obviously has been some pushback. I mean, the marker was stolen, um, and you know when you're speaking different places some people may say but you know white people have had it difficult too in history you can't just say that it's only an issue for for black people but i think it's important that we realize the differences in it um you know this is about race people are hating on a community because of the color of their skin and this is something that is not only in the past we see it in our prison system we see it in all these different institutions and we don't have you know, the opportunity to learn about it in our textbooks. It's not written out in a way that's easy for us to understand. We have to work a lot harder to see like the baseline of our own history. Um, so I, you know, I just try to explain that and I'm not invalidating anybody's pain or anybody's history, but we have to recognize the differences and the importance of, of recognizing black history. And, and I think in doing this work, it's just really important to me that I stress to young people that we have to take every opportunity you know, we have to make sure that kids have, are able to take trips. Because if I had not had the ability to go down to Alabama, I would never have begun this work. My life would, you know, I would still want to be doctor instead of wanting to be a civil rights attorney. And I, you know, would, it'd just be a lot different. And I, and I really hope that this project can also um, afford others the opportunity to, to gain this knowledge and to take opportunities and trips to experience life and hear people speak from this real life um, experience. Um, and I think that there need to be more resources and we need to have our education system um, really stress the importance of learning about our personal history within the states. And I think that this project would do a great job of helping schools, um, you know, put this into their curriculums and have their students learn it from a very young age um, and then continue to go in more detail as they get older. 
Um, and I think that for me, I try and show that people my age, teenagers, younger, um, older can all get involved in the community and can speak out and use their own voices um, to instill change and to fight against this fear that was put in to black people for so long. Um, and ways that we can do this is by having the difficult conversations. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna be uncomfortable sometimes, but that's why it's so important that we continue to do this work. Um, and I think we all need to be aware. We need to be aware of where we're standing, where we've come from and where we still need to go. Um, and we can't be blind to everything that's going on around us, but still wanna push forward because there's so much we can do. Um, and I'm so excited to continue to do this work. And I, I, I have you know, tons of ideas flowing through my head all the time of how I can get people together and how we can continue to grow. Uh, but I think the most important thing right now, obviously, is to vote. Uh, I mean, I just turned 18, so it's exciting for me to be able to go vote for the first time. And um, I just looking at where we are, there's a lot of power in that that we don't, I don't think everyone always realizes. Um, but I think that if we start by in putting this into our education system, people really seeing that there's so much change that needs to be had and realizing the power of a vote, of a single vote, um, people will really be able to see, you know, what a young person, I'm only 18 years old, but a vote can really change, you know, the entire, how we function as a nation. So um, that's the biggest piece for me. And I, and I hope that more people will get involved in this project and see how we are really trying just to help younger generations and older generations for us all to come together and see how remembering history and seeing how it's connected to today is really, really important for us to be able to move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Savannah, a really powerful message. And I do wanna give you a chance to um, share a little bit about the images um, here that we're seeing, um, which you've described to us as the state marker dedications. And I, I just wanna leave some space for you to share uh, a little bit about what we're seeing here in this photo. Yeah, so this is from the first marker ceremony. Um, this is an image of people gathering around as we read the text that is on the marker, um, which is very similar to the story that I read to you about George White. Um, and in the image, you can see um, Senator Brown and I'm on the right. Um, and then I think there's a few other images. Uh, that is just a picture of where the marker used to be before it was uh, stolen. So that was when I had gone to the set of the marker, I'd seen that it had been stolen and that is what I saw. It was just, you know, a dirt patch, like nothing had really been there. Um, and so I just think that that image is just really moving. You can see something that was, I think like 10 feet tall because it was in the ground um, and really heavy cemented in that was just removed out of hate. Um, that's what it was. That's what drove someone to put the effort in to, to steal it out of the ground. Um, so that's that image. And let's see one more. And then this is a picture from the second ceremony in October. Um, this is me and my family and a few other legislators um, reading the marker um, again. Um, and it just, I think it's important to see that like, we continue to fight to, to keep history going and I'm not gonna you know, stop fighting just because some people want to tear it down or try and remove it because I think that a lot of us here are tired of being silenced and we're ready to do the hard work it takes to move forward. Excellent. Thank you, Savannah. Um, again, very powerful message. And I want to thank you for sharing that along with your personal experience. Um, I think we all appreciated hearing that. Um, I'm going to now turn to um, Q&A. So if anybody has questions, again, I would encourage you to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and what we will do while we wait for your questions to come in, is we will talk about next steps for the project. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Young uh, to share his thoughts on next steps um, while the questions come into the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I hope you all have a chance to just reflect on what we've heard from Dr. Williams and Dr. Jones and Savannah Shepard and Alana Berry and Dr. Lampkin. Um, we have a remarkable opportunity. Um, the fact of it is Delaware presents an interesting opportunity for historians. As a border state, Delaware was not required to report incidents of racial violence to the federal government 
to the re during the reconstruction period. And several of the incidents of lynching and racial violence that occurred that we want to research more about were therefore not brought into the public record. And it's one of the reasons why the National Legacy uh, Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, where Savannah uh, had such a powerful experience, Delaware is not well represented in that because the information has not been as known for the group led by Brian Stevenson, the Equal Justice Project, to find the 4,400 uh, incidents of documented lynchings. So we have an opportunity to put Delaware on the map in a way that hasn't been done in the last 150 years. And it, therefore it's our responsibility to write history in a way that reflects what happened in Delaware. The project uh, provides a remarkable opportunity to do that. And the Unequal Justice Project, as you've heard, has uh, value in several ways. Uh, it has information value. Greater knowledge of the facts of history will lead to greater understanding. It has social value, bringing people together, bringing young people into the work like Savannah and, and many others who have learned and have asked, what can I do to find out more? The cultural value, representing uh, uh, what we stand, that, that Delaware stands for the truth. Good museums are both a shrine and a forum. And this opportunity provides a, a way for Delaware's public history to be a forum for understanding from different perspectives what we need to do to be uh, 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 representing and bearing witness about our shared past. It also has a symbolic value. The memory infrastructure, the museums, the markers, the monuments can evolve to represent more people. And until very recently, the markers, the museums, and the monuments did not reflect a lot of the Black Delaware experience. The markers and the monuments did not necessarily reflect the history of racial violence or the history of enslavement. Caesar Rodney's plantation near Dover, the Byfield plantation, the marker put up in 2005, does not even mention enslavement or the 200 enslaved laborers who worked that plantation. So that symbolic value that of changing the memory infrastructure becomes a very important thing. So the opportunity of experiencing the meaning of the past together, like the crowd reading the state historic marker at Price's Corner, not once, but twice, was an incredibly moving opportunity for hundreds of people to bear witness together. And that experience together is incredibly powerful. And it gives us a, a taste of what Dr. Jones was discussing about our shared humanity. This is heavy. And what we've learned about from Jacob Hamilton or Obi Evans or George White is that these are hard things about history that may not necessarily reflect well on Delaware, but we have to know them even so. And even amid these sort of heavy things, there are things you can do. You can vote. You can support this project. Our fundraising is already underway, building public and private support, and we're reaching out to law firms and many uh, corporations, as well as uh, uh, foundations, to build uh, and invest in even more Savannah Shepherds, more opportunities for field trips, and for even ways to go and see the unequal or the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, let alone the Mitchell Center or the Price's Corner historic markers, learning opportunities to bring young people into the work because they can drive the research. Uh, your support of the Delaware Historical Society will bring you the Delaware History Journal and upcoming uh, articles in it, such as Dr. Yuhuru's article on the lynching of Jacob uh, Hamilton in 1861. The articles coming up in the next journal also include a history of a previous epidemic in Delaware history, as well as more biographical sketches of Delaware's African-American suffragists commemorating the centennial of women's suffrage. You'll receive this if you join the membership of the society. The Mitchell Center blog will showcase updates on the project, including the local engagement to help us program 
uh, and uh, support and watch for community meaning and other public programs and communities, such as in Leipzig and in Smyrna. We intend to be uh, applying for more state historic markers to bear witness to the events uh, uh, that you've heard described here today. We also need you to fill out evaluations and tell us what you want to learn more about. Tell us what you need to know, what you're willing to do to help us, what surprises you. Savannah Shepard did not know this history. It's not in textbooks. It's in very few museums. And the memory infrastructure hasn't reflected this before. Uh, it, we're getting there, but we need to do more because when people see that the markers, the monuments, the museums do not reflect their own experience, a cynicism emerges that can be a barrier to an effective citizenry. And that means the markers that represent the truth, as we find out more information with explicit language uh, that really represents what happened, may find more people understanding their own story in the Delaware narratives. The project will establish important events in the memory infrastructure, more historic markers and prog public programs and development, but research is required and your support will help match the University of Delaware's commitment to student fellowships, which will support undergraduate and graduate research with faculty supervision for online research and getting into the smaller archives and the local community uh, uh, memory. We'd also like to conduct more oral histories. Um, the universities, therefore, are stretching and making commitments to this project. You've heard Savannah describe how public officials have been supportive and um, committed. Institutions like the Delaware Historical Society, the university, the Delaware State University, we are, th these institutions are stretching. They are committed to rewriting the narrative. And now it now comes to the larger statewide communities as well. We have institutions committing to learning more from what they didn't know and acknowledging the truth and complicity in what they have done to glorify uh, a, a kind of idealized path, past that may not always recognize the things that don't reflect well on the state's history. Uh, my organization has reached out to the owners and the leaders of the Friends of Belmont Hall in advance of the publication of Dr. Williams' article. Good museums are more than just a shrine to one version of history, but they are forums for discussion, for consideration and reflection on what learning new information together can do uh, and, and the power that comes from being a place that tells the truth. So the leaders of the Belmont, the Friends of Belmont Hall are aware of this project and we are working with them and we uh, anticipate an opportunity for community healing in Smyrna related to the, the trust building needed to bring a lot of people in to understand what happened there and to engage in meaningful discussion so that we understand together what we can do more of uh, um, to make that memory um, even uh, uh, as painful as it may be, representative of our commitment to a shared future. We may not have a shared past. And if our memory infrastructure doesn't reflect the varieties of stories, painful or not, in them, that shared past is a very divided territory. But we can commit to a shared future and the memory infrastructure can evolve that way to help us do that. Remember the memory infrastructure in, George, in, in Delaware included the whipping post more than markers and museums about resilience and agency. And that whipping post was put up in the 1990s and it was taken down in July of 2020. It was put there to represent some kind of angle on the story. We'd like to establish more markers and commitment to a wider diverse history of Delaware. And people will respond to that because of our commitment to telling the truth. Here we have a chance to build a shared future that bears witness and openly acknowledges, openly discusses and shares information, even challenging information that become the building blocks of a shared humanity. So rewriting, or in Dr. Jones's way, writing a new narrative based in reality and knowledge and feeling and empathy will help us create a humane and civilized society. It's an opportunity to 
to uh, evolve the Delaware narrative. And as a border state that wasn't required to uh, 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 submit this kind of information, we have it in our responsibility to bear witness to that information. The unconsumed past will either be faced and dealt with or it will consume the American Republic. And your commitment to the Unequal Justice Project, your uh, inquisitiveness and curiosity about what you need to find out more, or what you know that you could put us in touch with to learn more about uh, community memories, uh, uh, notebooks, repositories that, that may shed light on even more instances we're asking all citizens to become the Savannah Shepherds uh, of the next uh, steps in this project to help us learn more together about how we can build a more equitable understanding of Delaware history, uh, or else it will consume us. And we have an opportunity to be the deliverers of a more rightful understanding of Delaware history. The Unequal Justice Project uh, will continue to provide updates, but the Delaware History Journal and the Mitchell Center blog uh, will be the most ready ways to understand uh, next steps as we're continuing to create and develop public pro programs to carry this important research forward as a partnership in concert with our communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Young, and uh, thank you all for putting your questions into the Q&A box. So we're going to turn our attention um, so that we leave enough time to address as many of your questions as we can. Um, and if it's okay with the panelists, I will start reading through the questions. Um, some of them are directed specifically at uh, particular speakers and others are open questions. And I hope all the panelists um, will consider a response. Uh, so the first question here is from uh, Michelle. I believe it was said, the uh, Delaware has the largest community of, of Blacks. I've been studying Black abolitionists in Philadelphia, and I believe it was recorded as the largest population. Perhaps that was true of Delaware, but not that which occurred in Pennsylvania. Um, don't know if there is a uh, response to that for any of our panelists, um, but I, I will comment that, you know, part of engaging in this work um, will be the regional aspect of our work in terms of uh, comparing the experiences here in Delaware to places like Pennsylvania and Maryland. So I think some of that will be uncovered as we continue to do more research on the project, but I will leave others to comment if they have thoughts. I just wonder if the question's about free communities of color, because I think that's what James mentioned, the concentration of free people of color. And I think what James was indicating is that I think what it goes, if I'm getting the person's question right, and please clarify, um, Michelle, if you can, but Delaware's proportion of free persons of color is often skewed by the fact that you have so many free persons of color in Delaware who don't get counted or who show up in different ways in the census. So I think that's what he was alluding to, but I'm not sure from the question. Well, and I will say, um, you'll see on our slide, if you do have questions or inquiries, please use, uh, you can contact us at unequaljustice at dehistory.org. Um, I'm going to move to the next question from Sharice. Do you find parts of Delaware were very much a southern state? That's a great question. And I think when we talk about Southern, there's certainly something to be said for the way that people see the divide in Delaware. So we talk about, um, and the NAACP during the civil rights era was um, used to talk about the Southern part of Northern states being like the South. So Southern New Jersey was called the Georgia, the North. Southern Pennsylvania was, re was regarded as being very much South. The same is true for um, Delaware. So when we talk about Southern Delaware and we talk about Sussex County, certainly, um, you can see that not only because of the maintenance of slavery, but because of racial politics in that, that area. At the same time, you can't discount border communities. And I think that's a big part of my study and why I spent so much time talking about how important Smyrna and, and Lipsic are to understanding this phenomena, where when you're the margin of the margins, how do you define yourself? What's your identity? And you found in the period that I talked about where you had the Hamilton lynching, 
um, this desire as much as possible to maintain white supremacy because it was as big a part of their identity as it was of people who were living in Sussex County, perhaps even more so because they're so much closely uh, you know, up against Newcastle County, which is seen as more cosmopolitan and more oriented toward Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, which is a big problem in Delaware history, well documented by scholars who do Delaware history, this tension that exists between Newcastle County and the two Southern counties. And the reality is, and you know, I would make the same argument, there are two Southern counties, Kent and Sussex are Southern and Newcastle is Northern. And they do break along those lines. Historically, they've broken along those lines. If, if I could add um, some here too, as a Sussex Countyan and as a, a multi-generational Sussex Countyan, right? Um, I think for me, clearly the answer is yes, right? Um, although, again, when we talk about power and history and power, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have the ability to, to track my lineage back like numerous generations, but I can tell you that um, on three, three uh, trees of a family lineage in my history, my great-grandparents were slaves in Delaware. Right, or my great great grandparents were slaves in Delaware, and my great grandparents were sharecroppers. Um, and so, to to say, just to literally say, I'm I'm just a couple of generations removed, um, is just proof of that point. And and that lives all of those experiences of my um, kin live in me, right? Like um, the way that you know. I engage with and interact with the world is a product of those experiences, right? And, and I frequently talk about the intersection of name and last name, particularly in Delaware. And I think you heard some of that as, as uh, they gave the talk about the Belmont House, et cetera. Um, you, you know, often in our, our state, you know, we're multi-generational families um, and those, those connections are still there. Right, um, there are communities of of people, um, particularly in Sussex, in Sussex County, where it's very clear um, the connection between last name. Right, to not recognize those things, to not call those things out for what they are, um, is a barrier to healing. Right, um, and and I think that's what we're talking about and and beginning to unearth in this conversation, and even the broader conversation that's happening right now around justice um, and if it can be equal in a country um, that's rooted in these kinds of past and histories if we don't first confront them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Williams and Alana. Um, I'm going to move to the next question, which came from Don. Will the knowledge of at least two more lynchings in Delaware also be commemorated by historical markers? Um, I can speak on that a little bit. I think that's the goal. Um, we would love to have every lynching recognized in that way. Um, there definitely has to be, you know, a lot of community engagement to get everyone involved. Um, and, you know, if, if it's something that I um, end up leading, I would love to get a lot of younger students involved. So until like, I really think that um, a lot of, you know, schools are involved or students are involved, I think that that would be really important for it. So I hope that they are um, memorialized and, and that whoever is doing it um, really pulls out the importance of engaging younger students. And it's my understanding that there are uh, applications for a state marker through the state historic marker program uh, for the OB Evans uh, marker uh, coming in from citizens. But markers are not enough. And young people can also contribute creative ways to um, give life to this history, uh, find meaning in it uh, through uh, poetry, dramatic arts, uh, uh, technology that helps us connect the, the communities at the time or connect what happened uh, in the events that would be uh, um, commemora or commemorated through a marker 
in the context of the six degrees of segregation. So there are ways where the markers themselves are not an end, but can reveal more networks of connections of understanding. I was just going to mention very quickly, I think markers are important. I worked on a, a piece on the Collins Park bombing in 1959, which if you drove through that neighborhood before that marker was erected, there was just an empty lot with no context. And so I imagine that people that lived there passed that lot, and unless you were intergenerational and lived there for a long time, would not have known the story about why that lot remained vacant for so many years. Having said that, the marker is not enough because as Savannah indicated, if you're not having conversations with people about the meaning of that moment, there are plenty of places in Dover that have markers that basically uh, people pass every day and would never recognize the significance of them because there's no conversation around meaning. And that's important. Uh, I mentioned very quickly when we're talking about the difference between Kent and, and Sussex County and, and Newcastle County, we can document these lynchings in um, uh, Kent and Newcastle County. In Delaware, they, ex I'm sorry, in Sussex County, they execute. So the reality is in 1860, there's a triple execution of three black people on the same day in December, including the only black female to be executed in the state of Delaware. Um, at that time, Sarah Jane Bradley, who was 16 years old for supposedly poisoning the child of her master. So we have to understand those, those uh, geographic and regional uh, uh, distinctions. At the same time, I was happy to see them take the whipping post down, but I'd like to see some commemoration um, with regard to capital punishment because it problematizes the way that we think about that history in important ways. What does it mean to execute somebody for a crime related to chattel slavery? And how do you tell that story in a way that invites the community to reflect not only on the history of race and criminal justice, but the importance of our contemporary moment where race continues to have such a huge impact on our criminal justice system? I think that has to, they have to work in tandem. Delawareans love to tell the story of Patty Cannon and a reverse Underground Railroad as much as they love to tell the story of the Underground Railroad. But when you start digging into the more intricate, uh, deeper parts of that history, what you find is a state which is very much reflective of the national story. It's not really Delaware exceptionalism as much as it's an opportunity to try to fit Delaware into the national story. Thank you. Um, uh, one question here, I'm actually going to combine three questions in, in, to the best of my ability into one. And the question is really uh, about how this kind of information or this history can be included in the classroom. And I will say that for the Mitchell Center for African American Heritage, uh, one of our goals with much of the history we share included that, uh, which is shown in Journey to Freedom, we are actively making efforts to uh, provide educational content and supplemental materials to teachers uh, that they can use to supplement the curriculum that they're teaching in the classroom. Um, so the general, the big question here, uh, as I understand it, is you know, how, how can we work to have more of this history in the classroom? Um, and I welcome thoughts on that from the panelists. I can um, chime in for a second here. And I saw, um, again, uh, Ms. B.B. Coker's comment, which is, I think the point here, like, is that this is, a, this is all of our history. This is the history of America and that we can't just keep telling one one side or one piece or one section of it. Um, and so I, I do think it comes, my, my answer is it's, a, it's complex, right? Um, if you think about who decides curriculum in schools, um, it is often school boards. Um, so to David's point earlier about voting, that's critical, um, particularly in school board elections. Um, and and give it and you know the flexibility around giving voice at the in those spaces as well as citizens uh, we can all attend those meetings and give voice and give feedback um and if we're not elevating if we're not elevating these types of um points in those conversations change won't happen right um if we're not telling the stories of, Savannah, of, of the Savannahs, um, if we're not providing these kinds of experiences, if 
for 14 year olds and 15 year olds and eight year olds to, exp to, to have these kind of transformational um, experiences and understand their history differently. Um, yeah, I was on the same trip with Savannah and my eight year old nephew was with me. Um, and, and even to think about an eight year old going through um, th that um, the museum in Alabama. And I remember at the end, he said, um, he said, they really didn't treat black people well, huh? Right. And he's an eight year old. He got it right. You know what I'm, you know, and I said, yeah, that's true. Right. Um, and even having that experience where the, where you can process it, I think there's often this fear around age, um, around, you know, maturity level, etc. cetera. Um, but I think we're still telling the story of Columbus. We're still telling the story of all of these other people in, in elementary school and middle school. And I, and we really just have to widen our lens, but I, I personally believe we have to do the work ourselves. Right, um, because if we don't even know our history, how can we then advocate on how to diversify um, the history in schools and so on and so forth? And so I would say, you know, the first step is start with you, um, broaden, broaden your range of books and text, um, broaden your range of, of folks that you in, interact with, engage with, push yourself into uncomfortable spaces, um, and, then, and then bring others along with you to do that. I'm just gonna, Add to that, Alana, because I think you raise a couple of good points, but I'll, I'll do it from the other side, from, you know, my perspective coming to Delaware for the first time as a young assistant professor, and then being told that I had to teach pre-service teachers, and then being give, giving a list of text on Delaware history, which was a requirement at that time, and seeing no Black people and no, no voices of people of color. The reason I got interested in studying the Delaware lynching of George White to begin with was because I read this account of the lynching in a textbook, which was, you know, I found to be problematic and so I wanted to, you know, go even further. But I think it echoes um, some things that David raised that are very important. This is also about hiring, it's about prioritizing, and it's about funding. And the reality is that if you don't have a Stephanie Lampkin um, in a position that she's in to be guiding the work, then you're not going to see that reflected in the exhibits. If you're not hiring and pushing for um, African American studies, or faculty of color to teach courses relative to interests that reflect the full range of the African American experience and the American experience for that matter, then you're not going to see that show up. Um, it's hard for me sometimes because we talk about, um, particularly in communities of color, African Americans, the need for black history or African American history, but then the places, as David mentioned, where some of that history rests are not always accessible. So I would submit that there is enough African American history in the Delaware History Journal from the past 40 years to teach 15, uh, give you know anyone to earn a master's or PhD in African American history and Delaware history just from those, but they're not accessible. So part of it also is this question of when we find things, how do we do three things? And I think this is critical and it speaks to your point, Alana. Share them widely, make them accessible, which also includes translating them in language that people can actually understand, not writing for the academy, um, which is one of the things that I celebrate about Savannah. Savannah took a whole bunch of research and translated into hey folks pay attention this is important this is what we need to do this is why this matters and then the last piece of it making sure there's a um action loop where people don't simply receive that information the way that we did in the 80s on the black history text and you get a, a badge for it and you move on but the question is what are you going to do with it so what do we challenge about our built environment how do we change the markers and memorials that um, decorate our landscape how do we um, then use that to inform conversations in PTA meetings and on school councils about the type of curriculum that we'd like to see? How do we support uh, faculty who are doing that work in institutions uh, who may not have that funding? And how do we show up as authentic partners with state historical societies, museums, and others to say, look, um, if you want this traffic, here's a, you know, these are churches and civic organizations who'd be happy to spend an afternoon in your site but what's your site doing to document or share history that's valuable to us? And I think that just complements the things that you were sharing. Uh, to underscore what Dr. Williams said, it is an opportunity for public history. Um, there, there, there's so much local control over what gets taught, even if there were state mandated curriculum, local school boards may or may not align with those. So this is an opportunity for museums and publicly engaged uh, research that becomes explained to non-experts 
I think more effective public history will serve the cause of racial justice with projects such as this. Uh, let, let me uh, talk just for a minute about one possible um, way in which we could uh, influence uh, getting the work into the uh, public schools in Delaware. Uh, University of Delaware uh, coordinates a, uh, a program called Delaware Teachers Institute. Uh, and it's a program that um, uh, supports student uh, teachers in Delaware to come to the university and participate in training around a given content area. And it could be astrology, astronomy, I mean, <laughs> um, uh, math, in any number of areas. And it, uh, I spoke with the director of the program and, and she said that they have gotten grants to support um, particular topics that fund teachers who get a stipend and they come and they actually uh, are charged with developing a, a curriculum on the topic and then to go back and teach it. So uh, there's a, uh, if, we, if we could work with Delaware Inst Teachers Institute to mount a program around unequal justice as we've been talking, that program then could be a basis for teachers coming to um, get the curriculum, get the content, and then take it back and um, teach it. So I don't know how, it, it's not a large number of teachers, but it is one mechanism of the many that are possible that, that uh, can, uh, the, you, you, the Unequal Justice Pro Project can work with to uh, infuse the curriculum with the research that we are doing. Thank you, that was a great question. Um, I'm gonna to move to the next question, uh, which is directed at Savannah. And um, do you, can you talk a bit about the kind of studies uh, you've chosen to pursue um, now that you have started college? Yeah, so I'm at Swarthmore College uh, outside of Philadelphia. Um, and I'm not exactly sure like what my major and minor and, and all that will be, but I'm thinking something along the lines of anthropology, black studies, um, and that'll probably change. You've only been here for a month and I'm like trying to just gain as much knowledge as possible. Um, so it'll probably, you know, switch a little bit, but those two seem to be kind of like where I'm, I'm headed towards. Excellent, thank you. Um, on to our next question. This is about the Delaware History Journal. Could the Delaware History Journal be made available in public libraries? Uh, that's an excellent question, and we welcome that. We, we have a lot of university libraries that uh, are, have institutional memberships in the Historical Society and then do receive it. So, um, but public libraries, that, that's a different animal and it's a researchable question. That's a very helpful question because it's a great idea and there, there continue to be new findings, even in old issues of the journal, uh, to Yuhuru Williams's point. So we will do what we can to make that more widespread in the excellent library system of the state of Delaware. Thank you. Uh, this question is directed to um, Dr. James Jones. Um, has the Center for the Study of Diversity and the University of Delaware discussed the memo sent out by the President's Administration's Office of Management and Budget regarding federal funding for organizations discussing critical race theory and white supremacy. Uh, I'm not aware of that uh, memo. Uh, it may be discussed at the level of the president and um, the provost, but it has not come down to the, the, the center or to me. So I can't really say what what discussions have gone on. And I think this is with regards to the um, President Trump's memo, I think it was, uh, regarding funding for studying critical race theory and white in the- uh, Oh, 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 yeah, okay. No, no uh, I don't know. Uh, the President has uh, certainly taken on many topics that have been laid out there by President Trump on immigration and students and so on. I have not seen, not, it hasn't crossed my desk anyway, 
uh, what kind of response the university has made to that. Thank you. Um, uh, one more question here, and then we will move to close. Um, and this is from Miranda. Do we know why border states weren't required to report their extrajudicial ju incidences to the federal government? Uh, simply because they weren't under federal reconstruction. The reason we get some other filter from Delaware is because the Previns Bureau agents who are operating um, would get reports back about regional violence and sometimes would respond to that. So there's a, there are Delaware reports, which is where um, I was at least initially able to find some information on William O.B. Evans that set the date, then you could go in search of it in the newspapers. But the simple answer is that unless they were under federal reconstruction and had troops based there, then you, they're not mandated to, to make those reports to the government in the same way that those states that are under actual reconstruction there's a plethora of records at the National Archives that scholars have access to that document, you know, a range of activities related to Reconstruction in the South. So thank you, Dr. Williams, and I uh, thank you all for your questions. I hope we were able to address uh, all of them or most of them. And if we did not, or if you have thoughts following this panel discussion, um, on the screen, you'll see our email address for this project, which is unequaljustice at dehistory.org. We'd like to stay in conversation with you, so please feel free to uh, send us an email with your questions or thoughts for the project. I've also shared the evaluation form for this program in the chat. Um, however, we will send it as a follow-up email as well. Uh, just as you give yourself a moment to take in what you've heard today uh, and, and compile our thoughts in, into uh, responses for the evaluation. Um, to close us, I actually would like to turn to Alana Berry to bring us full circle to where this panel discussion really started. And again, leave us with some thoughts on what can we do now that we have this information and, and how can this really be a moment for us to reflect on this history? Um, so Alana. Sure, thank you. Um, and I, I think what has come up numerous times in this conversation um, has been reference uh, to Brian Stevenson and, and the concept of changing the narrative, right? Um, and, I, and, and today expanded upon into just in, into rewriting it. Um, but I think the piece that uh, Brian Stevenson often talks about, and I'm going to kind of bookend this between two quotes of his, is also around um, first getting proximate. So this notion of you have to get close to things um, and you have to be uncomfortable. And so you have to get close and then you, ha you have to get close to things that potentially um, are foreign to you or different to you and, and, and feel different. And, um, again, may fee make you feel uncomfortable. And then I say lean into that, right? Um, figure out what's, what's there for you and, and what's showing up. Um, and then, you know, get engaged. Um, one of the quotes from Brian Stevenson, he says, there is a strength, a power even, in understanding brokenness. Because embracing our brokenness creates a need and desire for mercy and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. When you experience mercy, you learn things you can't otherwise see. You hear things you can't otherwise hear. You begin to recognize the humanity that resides within each of us. And for me, that quote um, really sums up what I heard and, and am taking away from this conversation today it's that it's through these experiences, um, the experience that Savannah had, right? These, these experiences that create opportunity and connection and ultimately empathy, right? And understanding. And, and the hope is this, it also creates this seed or plants the seed to want to do more, to learn more, to discover more, right? If there's a gap, if we're not talking about uh, the history of black and brown and indigenous people, um, then let's learn more and then do more, right, about those things. Uh, again, this is around 
healing. Um, and as I said in the beginning, history is power and often has been used systemically um, to keep power. And so how do we begin as a community to both heal ourselves um, and, and to begin to create um, a system where, where power is equitable for all, right? And I, I truly believe that that starts with history um, and that understanding that history, understanding who you are um, and where you've come from and how all of these experiences that create this context of society that we live in, which um, Dr. Jones talked about, right? That like we, society is um, these series of experiences that we all experience and we all face. Um, but how do we begin to go out and do different things, right? And it creates this kind of hope um, that, that I feel is what we're all craving right now, right? Um, this we're on we're we're at this moment in time and history, and health and everything, um, where we have the choice to to let it propel us forward, right, um, or do the opposite of that. And I think in this moment, um, again, if I go back to that MLK quote around, rioting is the language of the unheard. Are we listening? And then what are we doing with that information once we hear it? What are the actions that we're taking? What are the experiences that we're trying to create? Um, and so with this, I'll leave you, again, bookending with Brian Stevenson, the kind of hope that creates a willingness to position oneself in, hopeless, in a hopeless place and be witness that allows one to believe in a better future. Even in the face of abuse of power, that kind of hope makes one strong. And I think together, um, if we're willing, if we're willing to go to those hopeless places and stand in front of even the most um, abusive power, that will come out a better community, healed and stronger. So thank you. Thank you, Alana, for leaving us with those really um, deep and in thoughtful words. And I think it gives us all a lot to think about as we continue on this path for pursuing the work that the Unequal Justice in Delaware Project aims to do. I want to just end by thanking all of our panelists today. It was a real honor to sit with you and have this time together to share the work that we're all doing. I want to thank Kobe Baker, who is our Mitchell Center Outreach Coordinator, for um, helping run some of the tech back inside of this um, and for also putting this great PowerPoint together for us. So thank you, Kobe. And, and please, if you do have questions, um, you have the email address for the Unequal Justice in Delaware Project, but please visit our website, dehistory.org, where you can find more information with membership, as well as upcoming programs uh, that, are, that will be coming out uh, by, throughout the end of the year and when we introduce our spring programs um, so you can engage with us more as we uncover these histories. So thank you all, uh, and thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Have a great day.